Yeah, I'll react to that, sure. Hey guys, okay. Um, why did the British attack the Chinese first opium war? Yeah, Britain. Um, they sort of wanted to do the same thing to China, what they did to India, but I think they were putting up more resistance, and so they got them hooked on drugs. I, I don't know, clearly. I'm ready to learn. If you're not ready to learn, there's the door. Home max down the hall. You're in the wrong class. Make me... Surprise me. Um... Yeah, let's go. My name's Connor. if you're new. I like to learn things and watch stuff. Go. Wars have been fought throughout history for a plethora of reasons. Territory, religion, secession, ideology. So for even the casual history buff, it doesn't come as a surprise that such a thing as an opium war once existed. But what was this oddly named conflict really about? And what actually happened? Opium it has been used for centuries as both a medicine and an all- So I say, so it seems like after the Napoleonic Wars, Great Britain really spent the next few decades solidifying their control over colonies since the French were defeated. Uh, does that sound about right? Often addictive recreational substance, and one empire decided to take steep advantage of it. It all began back in the 17th century, when the East India Company established budding trade relations with China. These ties would strengthen over time as the East India Company grew to dominate European trade with China and eventually led, in the mid-18th century, to the foundation of the Canton system, in which the contemporary Chinese Qing Dynasty would be able to better control the booming trade with the British. Okay. The only issue with this, though, for the Brits, at least, was that the Qing Dynasty Great map. really controlled the trade relations. British merchants could only trade with a specific group of Chinese merchants. They could only use one of the 13 factories from Canton and were not allowed to learn to speak Chinese. Nonetheless, there was extremely high demand for Chinese goods over in Britain, and the trade of silk, porcelain, and tea was still flourishing. So not allowed to learn Chinese. That's interesting. I'm assuming that's because the Chinese are smart, knowing that if the British can learn, am I being if the British can learn Chinese and they can communicate with Chinese merchants, and maybe little higher ups, and could form some kind of pact alliance with them that the Chinese don't know about. And it could lead to bad stuff down the road, right? This in itself slowly became an inconvenience for the East India Company, however, given the facts that the Chinese merchants would accept only one thing in exchange for their products. Silver. Silver. As a consequence, silver was leaving Britain at a rapid rate, and while they satisfied the demand for Chinese goods simultaneously, the inability to keep silver in their pockets began to bother the Brits. The solution, if you ask the East India Company, it would be opium. To be transparent, opium was not new to China when the British started to bring it. In fact, the use of the drug medicinally had begun back during the Tang Dynasty and was initially brought to China by Arab merchants. The opium trade was soon dominated by British merchants. By 1781, opium exports to China via... Sorry guys, so when I think of opium, I think of heroin. So... Um, I, I'm not exactly sure what the effects of opium are, um, if they are the, I mean, I've never done heroin before, so I, I don't know exactly what they would be like, but I know it is a, um, you know, it, it's not a cocaine sort of drug, it, it is a more of a, what's the terminology, uppers and downers? Uh, so I, I'd imagine it give you a very sort of zombie-like effect if you have too much of it. But again, I, I'm not exactly sure if... I know her heroin is derived from opium, so I don't know exactly if the opium of the time period we're talking about now would be even close to the same as heroin of today. 
supply of the Brits slowly began to become a regular occurrence. Since this trade would be the British key to solving the waning silver predicament, the British East India Company quickly established tight control over the industry and ensured that opium would be traded for the necessary silver and that related payments would end up in British. Sorry, if anyone's done heroin and opium and would like to uh, compare the two in the comments. Pockets. This plan worked for Sorry. the East over the industry and ensures that opium would be traded for the necessary silver and that related payments would end up in British pockets. This plan worked for the East India Company and the Great Britain, and for a while, it also worked for the Chinese. By giving more silver to the Brits, this allowed more Chinese goods to be sold to Britain in return, and the profitable cycle could continue. That was, however, only until the opium itself became a problem for the Qing authorities. Opium, being an often addictive drug, was creating a subsequent society of addicts, which began to destabilize the Chinese society. By 1799, the government had both banned the drug and put an end to the trade of it. The British merchants, however, were not willing to give up the solution that they had so happily found to the silver debacle. Unbothered by the bans. 1799. They continued to smuggle opium into China under the noses of the officials to then sell it to Chinese opium dealers. The trade thus continued and even flourished, especially as more European and American merchants decided to join the industry. Eventually, the Qing authorities began to seriously crack down on both the opium trade and British trade and monopoly as a whole. This angered the British merchants and sparked a new wave of tensions between Britain and China. The discord continued to escalate as both sides wanted to hold their ground. And the final straw soon came in the mid-19th century when the Chinese officials began to seize British opium for destruction. A few skirmishes broke out in response until finally the decision was made to go to war. The mindset of the British was simple. This was not a normal war. It was a punitive expedition, and the Chinese would face consequences for their attack on British trade. It always amazes me um, how much power um, British and American, you know, just uh, European powers with great navies, how much a great navy ca can can shock a country into, into submission, um, whether it be India, especially huge countries like India and China. Um, obviously, India more so than China and India, a lot to do with the factions that you could set against one another. One thing I'm sure China was trying to avoid, um, maybe part of with what they were trying to say, they didn't want them learning Chinese, uh, the, the British or European trades people, you know, learning Chinese to kind of foment divides and whatnot, but it always amazes me how a fleet of ships and cannons can subdue a country um, of, of this size. It's crazy. The I, there, there, there's more to that. It's more to it, I know. Um, so Chinese, on the flip side, were not quite as prepared since they did not expect the Brits to return after their previous skirmishes. Nevertheless, in the early summer of 1840, the first wave of British forces returned to China and demanded that the Qing authorities pay compensation for all the destroyed goods they had seized and additional damage done by the interference with British trade. Predictably, the Qing officials refused to do so. The Brits now resorted to Plan B. Through a coalition of naval and ground forces, the British then took the region of Dinghai on the Zhaoshan Island and were able to force brief negotiations with the Qing government, although this failed to resolve the conflict and the war continued. The Second Battle of Chun Pi in January of 1841 ended in favor of the Brits, and the Chinese attempted to make peace once again out of concern for their own ability, or lack of, to win the war. The Convention of Chunpo was written up in hopes of doing just that, but both governments simultaneously refused to sign the document, and henceforth continued the war.
with the Qing Battle of Chun, although this failed to resolve the conflict and the war continued. The Second Battle of Chun Pi in January of 1841 ended in favor of the Brits, and the Chinese attempted to make peace once again out of concern for their own ability, or lack of, to win the war. The convention. Yeah, yeah, it's annoying. I rewind. I missed something. I had to get it. Of Chun Po was written up in hopes of doing just that, but both governments simultaneously refused to sign the document, and henceforth continued the war. The British swiftly seized more Qing territory with the Battle of the Bogue and the Battle of First Bar that February, riding on their increasing wave of momentum for the months to come. The Qing administration still fought- When is like the Boxer Rebellion and stuff like that, I, I gotta learn. That that's later, right? back increasing wave of momentum for the months to come. The Qing administration still fought back as mightily as they could, but so far, it seems that nothing could stop the British war machine. One remarkable moment of aggression came in March, when the Brits had decided to consider negotiation with the Chinese government and sent a ship under the flag of truce, which the Qing shortly fired upon. In response, the stunned Brits targeted the fort at fault and set it ablaze. On March 18th, the British attacked and partially occupied Canton, finally reopening trade for British merchants after negotiating with the Chinese Kohong merchants. Two days later, though, a truce was declared and the Brits partially withdrew. After a failed night attack by the Qing troops in May, attempting to exterminate the Brits from the city of Canton, and by May 30th, all of Canton consequent- Wait, so did they just go up the river um, with the truce flags, or, or did they- did they- um? Hold on. Up the British war machine. Go, go ahead One if you need One remarkable moment of aggression came in March, when the Brits had decided to consider negotiation with the Chinese government and sent a ship under the flag of truce. Okay, I wasn't sure if they were invited and then they went up, but they sort of just went up anyway with a flag of truce, and so you, it's kind of hard to blame the people firing on them if if you're just, like, going up and not saying what, just like putting up a white flag and being like, okay, I'm going forward. But what if they don't want you to go forward? And so firing upon them, I, I can see why that would happen. Which the Qing shortly fired upon in response. Finally, two days later, though, a truce was declared and the Brits partially withdrew. After a failed night attack by the Qing troops in May, attempting to exterminate the Brits from the city of Canton, and by May 30th, all of Canton consequently fell under British authority. I know that the there are a day, series of truces that come in the Opium Wars where the Chinese keep getting beat worse and worse and the, the treaties keep getting more and more harsh. A treaty was signed between the local leadership and the Brits, which prompted the latter to withdraw further back to the Bogue forts. The war dragged on for months more, and the British luck began to change slightly. In two incidents, British ships were wrecked and survivors of the accidents were taken hostage and many later executed or killed by neglect in what would be named the Nair Buddha incident. Still, the tide soon favored the Brits again with the second capture of Chusan and the seizure of a Ningbo fort a few days later, followed shortly by the occupation of the entire city. A short break in the war came now with the winter of 1841, but by the following March, the conflict was back on with the British victory at the Battle of Ningpo and the immediate capture of the city of Sishi. More and more battles broke out, and the British troops again and again came out triumphant, though still, the Qing authorities were not ready to give in. Thanks to the stubborn strength of the Chinese, the war raged on until August of 1842, when the Qing government at last decided to negotiate peace with the British once more. Weeks of diplomatic talks were required for the two sides to finally come to any kind of satisfactory- I just want to say, I've been listening, amazing maps, topography, amazing maps. Talks were required for the two sides to finally come to any kind of satisfactory agreement. But eventually, on August 29th, 1842, the Treaty of Nanking was signed on the HMS Cornwallis and officially ended the First Opium War. The terms of the treaty greatly changed the former Canton system for foreign trade in China oh, in favor of the British merchants, which helped resolve- What is that island? I know, in, in favor of the British, I, I heard that, don't worry, my ADD is bad, but I heard that. What is that island? 
All right, sorry, ADD. Continue. Resolve the initial tensions that had built up to the point of the war. Additionally, the Qing authorities were to pay six million silver dollars in compensation to the Brits for the stolen opium and millions more for other reparations demanded by the British. All British prisoners of war were further released by the Chinese officials, and all Chinese citizens who had assisted the British efforts were to be granted amnesty. Few similar terms were forced on by the Brits. Contrarily, and lastly, Hong Kong seceded to the British Crown as a new Crown colony. A later treaty, known as the Treaty of the Bogue, was then signed the following year and saw the Qing government recognize Britain as an equal to China. And another year later, comparable treaties would be signed between the Qing and the United States and the Qing and France. Although it would take less than two decades for the second Opium War to break out nonetheless, the end of the first Opium War closed the door on a strange few years in history and put an end to the trade conflicts between the British and Chinese, even if only temporarily. Awesome video. That was great. Seeing how Hong Kong was taken by the British, I, I can sort of see being Chinese a little upset about kind of present day treaties. I, I know this is kind of like a sensitive topic, but I, I, I have no animosity or anything. I'm, I'm just asking a genuine or saying a genuine thing. I'd be like, uh, how did you get Hong Kong in the first place? You know what I mean? I don't know enough about the topic. Awesome video. I will be excited. I'm assuming he will do second Opium War or I can watch something else. I watched some stuff about the Opium War, but if you know me at all at this point, then uh, redundancy is, is my best friend in learning. See you guys next time. I, I've, you know, I feel like I said all I really wanted to say during the video, and I'm excited for the next one. I wasn't totally clueless, but it helped out. See you next time.